Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tina Sachs. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Social Welfare. I'm going to be moderating the panel. We will have um, John and Francis come to the, to the stage here and provide a little bit of background on their engagement with the film. And we, this is a panel discussion, so we're going to be having a conversation amongst the three of us, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers from the audience in a bit. So Francis, I wonder if you could begin by telling us a little bit about your, what brought you to this work. As a child, um, as a growing up in the family that I did, um, you know, things weren't talked about anyway. I mean, nothing was talked about except what you were going to, you know, succeed in or do. And, and um, so, um, like most people, I think, with a heart in the South, they, you know, you could tell that something was deeply, deeply wrong um, in the field of race relations. And, um, and the only, the only um, you know, uh, the only thing I had to, to was, were the people in my life, you know, and as I, as I talk about in the film, um, these were people um, uh, that worked for our family. And um, I, although I rarely went on the other side of the tracks, I, you know, I went to a white segregated, you know, academy, you know, whites only, um, I, I could just see, I mean, little things, little... Uh, observations um, going to Mississippi you know was was I could see you know white and black not making um, eye contact in the in the Walmart um, I could um, my family was and I relate some of this and, and our team tried to get me to 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 go into more personal detail in the film but as a journalist I really wanted to tell the story that I thought I hadn't seen, you know, the documentary that I hadn't seen. It was like, where are white people claiming, you know, why aren't they claiming this um, awful history? And, that, and why is it that African Americans are left to bear this burden, this cultural and historical trauma? Mm -hmm. um, but so it was, as a child, just being incredibly um, sad and seeing um, the separation and seeing the, I mean, clearly it was economic, um, first and foremost, and then I wanted to understand why, you know, education, employment, housing, you know, the three-legged stool of the American dream, how, how that was repeatedly um, denied, and so I could, I could see that, and as a child, it really, it really tore, it tore through me. Um, and so, as, as I later went on, it's, I think it's a huge part of why I became a journalist, um, I went to UNC Chapel Hill, and we were among the first Southern universities, if not the first Southern university, to uh, oppose apartheid um, as an institution. And so it was, it was a lot of, of things coming together, you know, to, to make um, the film, but it was, it was, I just couldn't understand why nobody, um, at least in my world, was talking about it, and as a as a child, you're kind of subject to the your family and their their whims and their and so as I got older and, and um, you know developed my skill set, it was it was a film, and Sally felt the same way. I mean, we both we both talked about it um, for a long time, um, and really, John um, really crystallized for me the angle, the thread of really going after the Southern political power that manifested on a national level. So that was the inspiration I was um, uh, talking about earlier. So it just, it's, and as, you know, documentaries are like sausage, you know. It's, it's uh, having the team that we had and the sensitivity and, you know, it, it all just kind of um, came together. But um, mainly just, it, these are things that I would cry about um, as a child? As a child. These are things that I would cry myself to sleep about. Um, and, I, and I just did recently did a TED talk called Behind the Long Shadow. Um, and I did actually talk about Henry and, and um, Jimmy, uh, not Jimmy May, but Henry and um, Gwen, who were two people that worked for our families, and the incidences of, of racism 
um, that I saw around them from my own family, which was very always very polite about it. But you know, um, it, it was still I heard and saw you know terrible things. Um, and of course, I, I know that my experience of it was at one millionth. Um, and so I just I wanted to make a film that. I know some of the history that's in the movie is probably very familiar to this crowd, um, but I really wanted to make a film that could play in junior high schools, and um, of course I made it for everybody, but I, I really made it for, for white people, um, either white people who are overtly racist or people that it, um, might be willing to look at their unconscious um, racism. Um, so as I, as I think I told Rocky, I can die happy now. I made the film. <laughs> I made the film that I had to make. Thank so. you. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing that. And I wonder, John, if you could share some reflections about your role in this film, or even how you came to know each other, how you came to be involved. Yeah. Well, again, uh, thanks, uh, Francis, and all of you. I, you know, in some ways, I think that's a. It's a very interesting question, but it's a question without an ending or beginning. And it's like, when when did you become aware of race in the United States? It's like. When did I become aware? You know, it's like, it's, it's here. And, you know, I'm always shocked when people say they, you know, they have no consciousness because it's everywhere. And if it wasn't obvious, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it's like, we have a white supremacist, white nationalist in the White House. So, you know, it's like everything, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen, my friend is the background, uh, Marianne, you've seen a lot of nat nativity scenes where they have uh, the baby Jesus and Mary separated in cages, right? Uh, that's racial. You know, the fact that this country could put today, that's the other thing that I think is really important about the film and about the discussion, is we, we're talking about how we live today and what we're fighting over and struggling over. And one reason I was so uh, delighted the film was made and to be a part of it, we're struggling over will there be an America? We are struggling, as I said in the film, we are still fighting the Civil War and we're losing. And it's no longer the Southern strategy. The Southern strategy has become the national strategy, if not the global strategy. Uh, and it, it, it couldn't be more important. I mean, I, I can't imagine. I'd literally say to people, and I believe it, that if we don't get this right, we don't get to keep our country, and we probably don't get to keep the planet. Uh, this is just how dire this is. Um, and as I said in the film, the heart of it is trying to understand not white people, but the sickness of white ideology and domination. Um, how do we actually address that in a critical way, but also in a loving way? How do we say, how do we move forward so that we all have a role of mutuality and respect. Now for some people who are believe in white nationalism, white dominance, they don't want that. You know, they've actually said, I don't, I'm not mutual with you. You know, I don't, want, I don't respect you. And in fact, the very fact that you're asking for respect, President Obama, is offensive. The very assumption that you think you can be president, you know, the very assumption that you think you could be in the White House and not be in the kitchen, Woodrow Wilson would be turning over in his grave, right? Uh, so I think, I think this issue is so important. I think it needs to get out more. And we need to think about what do we do with this? What do we do with this so that we all have a role in changing it, in living it? Um, and some interesting and positive things are happening, but also some very scary things are happening. So, um, you know, I, uh, there's no one thing that I can point to. This, you know, I could pick out things like my family. My family was part of that great migration from the South, The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkins. Um, but I, I, just one last thing. I showed my dad's, uh, actually another film, Race to Power of Illusion. Uh, my dad recently passed um, at, at 99. Uh, but when he saw that film, he cried. And he said, I have lived all of that, but I hadn't put it together. And that I think we owe a debt of gratitude to Francis for because we know it all, but you put it together. So thank you. Also, John, I wonder, I just want to pose a, another question to you. And um, recently, uh, 
a scholar of race, Noel Ignatiev, passed away. And he said, treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. So I'm just wondering, John, if you could talk a little bit more about the creation of whiteness as an idea and the ways that it's played out in the United States. Um, and you, you alluded to this just now, but what do you think are the elements of whiteness that we still need to contend with in the US? Well, and, and it was addressed somewhat in the film, but the idea that, um, you know, first of all, the white, whiteness was a middle stratum, which I think is important mm -hmm. to remember. Because if we're really going to address whiteness, it, it means actually breaking with the corporate elites. Uh, it's always about control and, and, and money. Um, you know, that the, the slavery at one point in history was the largest real estate in the United States. Right. Um, and so, uh, and then a friend of mine, another friend of mine, David Rodiger, wrote a book called Wages of Whiteness. Um, playing off of something that W.B. Du Bois talked about, The Wages of Whiteness. Um, but Rodeker turned it into a book. And he talked about all the things that you were given or promised in relationship to being white. Uh, respect, the right to vote, the stuff that came out of the GI Bill, um, cheap loans, but also the sense that you were always over someone else. That you could always dominate someone else. That this was your country, notwithstanding when we talk about the Ohlone tribes, or when we talk about uh, Native Americans, when we talk about, I mean, when you, when you look at it, the, the, the construction of whiteness, and particularly white maleness, although, you know, obviously it's not limited to white males, is quite amazing. And it's quite life-denying. Uh, it denies our relationship with each other. It denies our relationship with nature. Globalism, I mean, climate change. It denies our responsibility to the world. Uh, and the solution for all this anxiety and fear is that you get to feel that you're better than somebody, you dominate somebody, and you get to carry a gun. Uh, in fact, you better carry a gun, right? Because the world is a scary place, and there are a lot of people um, after your stuff. So. Here's the, here's the tricky part for us, the two parts, I think. My guess is, you know, to be just candid, I guess there, my guess is there are not many Trump supporters in here. Uh, and if you, if you are, God bless you, you know. And I'm glad you're here. Yes, yes. Uh, so for those of us who are, think of ourselves as left, left of center, this, um, how do we move forward so that we all move together? And we haven't done that. And so on the left, there's a blaming and shaming culture. Uh, we had our conference on othering and belonging. And one of my friends, a uh, very prominent Muslim woman, Linda Sorsas, some of you know her, she made the comment publicly, so I think I could repeat it. She said, F white women. She said, 53% of them voted for Trump. And I'm a Muslim woman from Palestine, so F white women. And I said, Linda, you know, I understand your frustration and your, but those women are not here at the conference. The 47% of women who didn't vote for Trump are the ones which largely came to our conference. I'm not saying there were no Trump supporters there, but I bet you they were in small supply. And what I was saying to her is that you can't dismiss all white women for the 53%. Uh, but for those who really reject Trump, and not Trump as a person, but for all of the white supremacy uh, xenophobic, uh, sexist, uh, homophobic stuff that he stands for. Those who reject that, I'll say this to you. I don't want you as an ally. This has to be your fight. Not as an ally. Your fight. Uh, we have to be in this together. And it doesn't mean being in it together that we don't have different roles. It doesn't mean you get to come into a group and dominate. That's, that wouldn't make it your fight either. But how do we move forward? And most of the stuff on the left, as I read, of consign progressive and liberal whites to a role of allyship, uh, angst with guilt and shame. And I'm not saying guilt and shame plays no role. But I'm not that interested in that. I'm interested in moving forward. And so, uh, and moving forward in a positive way, and moving forward really with love and respect for all life. So that's, I think, 
what we need to be moving toward. And that, I think, would actually usher not only a new identity for the country, but more importantly, a new identity for whiteness. Francis, I wonder if you have any response to that. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> um, oh, I do. Um, you know, and it was, it was I, you know, just that, that vibe right there is what's so uh, uh, just stunned me about John. You know, it was like, um, I had a, and maybe this is a well-known story, but I had a, I had a friend who um, knew the Dalai Lama and, and she had lunch, it was just a lunch with him one day. And um, it, basically the gist of the story was that um, if, if there was any person on the earth who had, you know, reasons to um, be upset with the Chinese, yet he was showing the Chinese love and um, he, uh, you know, and, and that's the, the type of leadership, you know, that, that um, is so instructive and, and just so helpful, <laughs> so measurably um, helpful. It, it was interesting as you were speaking, um, you know, in terms of reception to the film, the film premiered at the Mill Valley Film Festival in 2017. Um, so it's been out for a couple of years. And so, um, you know, I, I am the one that most frequently gets the reception to the film, good or bad or indifferent, and it's been, um, it's been kind of, um, n now that I've done the TED Talk, I mean, it's been very hard to get the scene film, get the film seen. Um, uh, and I, you know, I, I have the luxury to make the films that I want to make regardless of editorial bent, and I, you know, ultimately the buck stops with me. And, um, and so I've been very surprised that people have been, um, the African American community has embraced the film. In fact, two uh, African American women from Illinois um, approached me and formed the Together is Better Alliance. And they were inspired by the film. They've now formed a nonprofit and they're taking the film out into the world. And the, 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 it's a coalition of white and black people who, who understand that we've just got a lot of work left to do. Um, but the, uh, some of the criticism or the, the, the challenge in getting the film seen is from white people, predominantly liberal white people, who question whether I had the right to even make the film. And, um, <laughs> yep. Some in this, in this community. Um, so I was surprised by that. I was really surprised by that. And, um, but not daunted by it. Um, you know, we, we just keep pushing, pushing, and pushing just to get the film seen um, wherever we can. And obviously we're pushing for the, for the middle of the country and in the south. Most, most uh, the film will be on um, PBS, I'm happy to say. Oh, congratulations. Yes, thank you. In February, it's um, it'll each individual station will decide whether they pick um, the film up. But KCVR, I think, is LA, San Bernardino. They just picked it up, so that's five percent of the country, <laughs> right there. Um, so, but you know, Kelly Clement at um, the programmer documentary programmer at Mill Valley, you know, said um, it said to me, um, it's one of the most sensitive films. Um, I think he, he said it at the festival or that he had seen and it was like wow when people really get it they really get it and um, and it's really is about love it's about um, uh, and it's about standing up for what you know is right and even though again the you know, the South is such a place it's I almost it's hard for me to go back you know because it's just so um, I purposefully on my Facebook page, you know, I like every one of my high school friends, you know, because, and inevitably when I post something about the movie or whatever, nothing, nothing. It's like, it's, get, it's getting worse. I mean, it, it, you know, unfortunately, um, people are digging in because they feel so threatened in the way that you so beautifully point out in the film. So um, one of the most important lines, I think, um, and you just referred to it again, this idea that the mass psychology that if you are, you know, you, you, like I have 
I have white people come up to me and say, I'm struggling in this economy. And I talk about this in the TED Talk. I'm struggling in this, US econ I'm in this economy. And I say to them, well, just remember that the color of your skin will never have negative consequences for you in your life, you know? And, um, you know, it, it's this idea that you, no matter how much you might be struggling, it's still so prevalent in our society that you still are above African Americans, which of course I knew not to be true when I was 10, you know, as much as I know it to be true now, and that it that really is about opportunity. Um, and when, when given opportunity, um, when there's a level playing field, there's, I mean, there's no difference with us any, anyhow, spiritually. But um, that was one of the reasons I, you know, I went to Canada and I did the Namini Hall. It's like I wanted people to show what it could have been like had we not uh, done what we did, had my family not done, you know, what they did. So things might have turned, obviously things would have turned out very differently. Um, that's a really a great segue to how you decided to include Nominee Hall, mm -hmm. how you found out about it. Yeah. If you could just give us a little backstory on that. Oh, my mind's like a crazy neighborhood. You don't want to go in alone. I mean, it's it, in terms of how I found, um, you know, how I found that story. Um, I, I, I've been asked that before, and also the story in Canada. Um, you know, I just spend hours, hours, you know, searching and searching and searching. Um, and like the opportunity to interview the great-granddaughter of a slave, which I did in, um, in um, Canada, um, the fact that LaTanya had, had organized the slave legacy. And, you know, and as I'm at, at my core, I say I'm an active, accidental activist. I'm really at my core, I'm a journalist, you know. And I want to introduce my team, also our team. Um, uh, let me just finish that, and then I want to recognize them, if that's OK. Um, uh, it, it, it just jumped off. It just, I leapt off, the, I jumped out of my chair when I saw it, and, and LaTanya, um, you know, there was this record as a journalist to have this paper trail. You know, it's one of the reasons I love Dr. Horn's scholarship so more. I mean, he's just one of our nation's most important historians. His, I just encourage you to read his books. I mean, just the meticulous research. It was just a revelation to me. And so when I ran across Nominai, I was just, I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and it was just delightful. So um, Maureen Gosling is our co-creator co and editor. He's here, and uh, Jed Reif, producer, Berkeley based, and then Donald Goldmacher is a, come on, where's Donald, is he gone, there he is, coming up, a producer on the film, and I think we lost Ashley James, was a cinematographer on the, on the film, so, um, you know, it, it really, really was, um, it takes all of us. I mean, we battled it out in edit, you know, about things. They wanted me to be more in the film. I know Susie and Sheila and everybody wanted me to be more in the film. And I just, that was the story I had to tell. So. And also, since you're, you're you know, you're very upfront in the film about your family's story, your, the implications of that story. So I wonder if you, you know, as, as a country, we're trying to deal with the, the idea of reparations now. Right. And I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Your family history and other stories that are in the film reveal structural <coughs> racism to such a great degree. And I wonder if you have any recommendations or any ideas or anything you would share with us as a, as a country as we're trying to grapple with the idea of reparations or as well as to the committee, these congressional committees that are also trying to think about that. Well, it, and it's a great question. Um, I, it, it's a lot there. Um, um, yeah, if, if being lesbian wasn't enough to get me disowned, this pretty much put the, the nail in the coffin um, with my southern family. Um, but, um, uh, you know, and I will, I will leave it to greater minds um, than mine in terms of what's happening right now in the country. I know there's a house, it's House Bill 40, 44 um, uh, in terms of a reparations bill. 
Um, it just, you know, it, it, I didn't talk about it in the film, but of course we've already done this with Japanese Americans after World War II. Um, we went to, we actually didn't make it into the film, but I went to Uruguay and interviewed the president, Jose Mujica, in Europe, and they have a national policy of reparations there. And we did a, you know, kind of a, we did a, a, a screening of the film in its earliest stages, and everybody was just insistent that we stay in America, that the problem was so great in America that we, we shouldn't go to another country. But um, this is not that difficult. I mean, they're, they're doing universe, you know, universal income, and I think, I don't know if I dreamt this because I wanted it to be true. I know they're doing universal income in Africa, in communities in Africa, but I think they did one in, in Stockton. In, in, yeah, in, right, and also in Alabama. You know, and so and, and they went into, and I mean, giving these families $1,000 a month changed their lives. Um, so when you, I mean, when you hear negativity about stuff like that, it's just racist. I mean, it's just flat out racist. I mean, which is another reason I made the film. I got so tired of hearing these same racist tropes over and over again that I knew weren't true. Um, and so in the end, I mean, it's a full-time job for me and the team to just promote the film. And to, I, think, and I think that's the, you know, that's how bad the problem is, that, that people don't, I mean, I, we have I've had backlash by, you know, uh, PBS programmers already in the South you know, uh, who just who just recite this, just come back with this clearly racist. If you don't like the film, that's one thing. You know, if you don't think it's a good film or they don't like me how I narrate, oh, that's all fine. But it's like these, these comments that come back are just so clearly racist. And they don't even know it. So they don't even recognize it. Or if they do, well, you know, even worse. But, but um, so promoting the film and really helping people connect the dots of this history um, and and there is there has been great reception to the film in those communities that were that are willing to be open about it. But it, it's just still so hard to understand how we are going backwards. Um, but the southern strategy is a national strategy, and it's just um, and and maybe there's a silver lining in that people that were sitting on the sidelines or people might be willing to question their beliefs. I mean, we could debate that, I guess all afternoon uh, but just getting the, the film scene and, and having the light bulbs go off for people I mean there was a, a guy in Arizona who saw the film who's also reading white fragility who's going to start teaching a class about it um, about white fragility and so um, you know that's action it's 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 time for action but if you don't understand that there's a problem to begin with I mean that it's because we've put our heads in the sand for so long about it and that it, it's risen to this level of, of urgency. I feel a sense of urgency. I felt it since I was, you know, six years old. So. Thank you so much for that. Um, and John, I wonder if you have any other, any other insights or things you want to share about the idea of reparations in the context of structural discrimination. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> So, like a lot of ideas, reparations is really important, but an idea can be framed badly, or operationalized badly, or well. And, the, and we have to be um, mindful and thoughtful to make sure that we don't take an important idea and allow it to be framed poorly. Um, so one thing I want to acknowledge. So, the history of slavery and racism and taking of the Native American land is not the history of African people. It's not the history of Native American people. It's the history of the United States. That's what we're talking about. Uh, if you want to study Afri about African people, there's a lot out there, and it's rich, some gaps with some rich literature. If you want to study the history of Native American people, again, there's a rich history out there, a lot of gaps. Uh, but it's not about taking their land. That's the history of Europeans. Uh, and so when we think, of, and first of all, that's important for a couple of reasons. So the structure of white supremacy and racial hierarchy and uh, that's so beautifully demonstrated in the film is something that actually structures America. And it structures America whether you're white, black, Latino, Asian, straight, gay. It's actually talking about the structure and institutions that actually permeate 
our society. Uh, so sometimes we think about thinking about slavery is just talking about black people. Not that that's unimportant, but we're really talking about the U.S. economy. We're talking about capitalism. We're talking about a particular kind of capitalism, not Canadian capitalism, but U.S. capitalism. We're talking about extracting labor from people uh, in a particular way. We're talking about breeding people. We're talking about that now as we have a new fight about abortion rights. So, so these issues actually are so core that if we actually limit them to just black people, not to erase black people, but we miss how significant it is, one, in terms of structuring the United States, and two, in terms of structuring this sad identity around whiteness. So reparation, the literal meaning of it, means to repair. In that sense, the whole country needs repairing. The whole country needs healing. Uh, now I think blacks actually pay a particular role in that, but from my perspective, there should be a larger discussion as how do we heal this country? And my sense is we can't heal it unless we address slavery, Jim Crow, mass incarceration, and white supremacy and white nationalism. Uh, and, and I think in some ways, and some people will be disagree with me on this, and some people think we have to narrow the discussion, I think we have to enlarge the discussion. Because what people hear when they hear about reparation, and when I say people, I really, I'm really talking about white people. Uh, they hear they're gonna lose something. Uh, they hear you're gonna take something from one people to give to another people. And I think if we talk about reparations in a broad sense, we're talking about something that actually allows the country to become a place where life is welcome and we can grow. I'll give you a quick example. Now, there's a lot I could say, but I, I, I'm a mi mindful of time, and you've already heard me in the film. There's a book called uh, The Race Between Education and Technology, written by two Harvard economists. One of them is a friend. And they argue that at the beginning of the 20th century, when the United States brought women into formal education, and they didn't do it perfectly, we still haven't done it perfectly, but when they did that, in a sense, more than any other major country in the world, there was a fight about women taking things from men, taking these scarce resources called higher education, and then they would go off and have children and you know, not use them. That's not what happened. Some of them did have children, but they still use it. But in looking back, economists now say that is what caused the U.S. economy to explode in a positive way. Uh, that we were tapping in all of these resources, all of this capacity, all of this spiritual grounding that we had left on the side. If you look at education today, the majority of children starting kindergarten are kids of color. If you look at the workforce today, the majority of people coming to the workforce are people of color. So if you leave that on the table, if you don't invest in those people, and we're not, then it means we're playing with less than a half a deck and we're playing against each other. The last thing I'll say on this is that any serious researcher will tell you not to focus on a single dimension, whether it's income, whether it's education, whether it's uh, you know, housing, all three of those are important. But they would say we're looking at complex systems that are interactive. But if you were going to focus on a single, a single indicator, which you're not, <laughs> it would be wealth. Right. And the projection is that by 2054, the collective black wealth in the United States will be somewhere between zero and negative. Based on all of these structures, an example I give is I'm six of nine, which means there are nine children, I'm number six. Doesn't mean I'm a bork, uh, <laughs> for those of you who watch Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> my father and mother came from the South, they bought a house, you may see the house in some of the films that I've been in. That house was perfect as long as they kept it. Uh, I helped my dad buy a new house recently. Um, they bought that house uh, for $11,000. When my dad sold the house, my mother had passed, they sold that house in Detroit for $5,000. That house in the suburbs, and I talked to the Federal Reserve Board about this, 
That house, reparations, right? That house in the suburb would have been worth somewhere between three hundred fifty and four hundred thousand dollars. Now that's my family. Now multiply by the millions of blacks. Uh, again, like the person in the film, uh, Mr. Willis. My family did things by the books. They worked hard. They studied. Uh, you know, they tried not to harass white people too much. <laughs> uh, they were upset that I was doing too much harassment. Uh, and what they get out of it is nothing. Right. right? And if they had been white, if they'd been in the suburbs, uh, nothing else, $400,000. So how do we fix that? And it's, it's not the past. That's what's happening now. Uh, and so reparation, you know, for my siblings means nothing's passed down in terms of income. Uh, and that's re re repeated over and over and over and over again. And their white counterparts are thinking that I worked hard and I bought my house and I kept it up. Yeah, you did all that. But you had the government to stand on. You had the banking industry to stand on. You had the zoning industry to stand on. Uh, you had all of these things that were largely either not there for the black community or working against the black community and still working against the black community. So it's not that you didn't work hard for what you got, but what you got was something someone else was didn't denied. Get, didn't get. Was denied, yeah. affirmatively denied. The last thing I'll say is that, to me, the goal is not to simply end discrimination, whatever that is. The goal is to promote positive outcomes that we believe in. To affirmatively promote positive outcomes. Not to say to stop discrimination, because it's too complex. Uh, and as you know, here in the Bay Area, we're fighting some of these battles right now. The Marin schools, right? There was just an order for them to desegregate, not even integrate, to desegregate. Uh, and the, the good folks of Marin, meaning many upper middle class white folks are saying, we're liberal, but we don't want to integrate. We don't want to desegregate, not even integrate. Let the black kids stay where they are, where they won't get quality teachers, where they won't get a good education, where they won't be able to go to college. Uh, that's in liberal Bay Area today. So yes, we need to have a much longer discussion. It needs to be in high schools and colleges. And we need to think about how do we get to a place where we all can fully participate, all can fully belong, all can be fully respected, uh, and build a world and society for all of us. So just before we open it to the audience for questions or comments, I wonder if you have any, either of you have any closing remarks. The, John, that was a pretty good one, I, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> but Francis or John, do you have anything else in closing you'd like to share? No, I think um, it, if, you, if you just help us with um, getting the word out about the film, I mean, uh, we're at thelongshadowfilm.com. Um, and... Uh, uh, we're on Amazon, Vudu, Google Play, and um, iTunes. And um, encourage, uh, I guess, KQED here um, to, to pick up the film. Um, to, they, know, they know that it's gonna be uplinked on January 18th. Um, so, and also, if you wouldn't mind going to ted.com and, and liking, uh, if, if you don't, if you don't like it, don't <laughs> like it, but watching, uh, watching my TED Talk, because that's a platform on the internet that you know we, we it's hard for us to reach, so we really want to leverage that. But uh, yeah, but that's it. But thank you very much for the great questions and the homework and everything. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to open to the audience. If people have questions, if you, I will. Oh boy, a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. So I, the first person I saw was here, um, and then I'll get. Oh, they've seen it. <laughs> they've seen it. Yeah, no, my family has seen it. And they, while they love and um, support me, it's just a kind of a, a, a bridge too far. Um, my parents are in their 80s, and my dad kind of came back, and he, he wanted me to include, he's a real military war buff, a military war guy, and so he wanted me to come back and show all the great things that all the Pendletons did in Virginia, you know. One, one guy was um, Stonewall Jackson's lieutenant, you know, and he was a terrible racist. Um, so um, it, it, um, it, 
you develop a kind of a thick skin about it. You know, they, they, um, my dad came to see the film. Um, I think my uncle watched it. Um, but, uh, the, it's too, it's the family dynamics. You know, it, it was, I, I told the family secrets, you know, and that, I think that was as offensive to them as, as the other stuff. But I think it opened my dad's eyes in, in some ways. I think he, you know, he expressed support and that how could we have done that? I mean, I never thought I would, I never would have thought I would have heard that come out of his mouth. How could we have done this as a nation and that kind of stuff. So, um, so in terms of, you know, the South, it's just, um, it, it, I, boy, it's a bigger pay grade than I've got to diagnose um, you know, it, it just, it's hardened. It's just, it's hardwired and these beliefs are hardwired and we know a little bit about psychology, right? Stuff does get, beliefs do get hardwired into your brain and then, you know, this, this guy comes along, Trump, and, you know, it just, it's, he's saying, you know, for the first time what everybody's thinking and then that, then it becomes acceptable and, um, somehow legitimized um, so but we'll keep trying I mean it's a great thing about film it's it's and we're having some we're having success I don't mean to say that we haven't because we have I mean we're um, uh, but um, uh, we'll keep we're gonna keep plugging it's a great thing about film it's there forever right and so our film heist who stole the American dream is still um, you know, we hear all the time about heist. People are watching that film and looking at economic injustice. So um, we're, we're, we have a long-term game plan to keep the film out there. Thank you. Thank you. So I have, let me just find this quickly. Yeah. And I, I know I have a couple of friends here who are filmmakers as well. Here's a film that I think, uh, Francis, you might want to make or you might want to make. And <laughs> so here's, an, and I'm sort of only being tongue-in-cheek, but only partially. Uh, there's a film, an old film I'll call good, The Good Doctors, and it's about doctors in Germany, and you follow, you, you, get to, you get to know them. They're decent people. They're all men. They're decent people, and Jews come to them and they fix them up in the daytime, and at night they go to the gas chambers and kill them, right? right? But it's, it's actually giving, it's a complication, complicated thing. So they're not just bad people. They're also good people, right? And I think sometimes we get into this binary. It's like, is this a good person or a bad person? Right. As opposed to, it's a complicated person that's structured and organized to do terrible things. Uh, so someone might make a film <laughs> called The Good Racist. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and I, I mean, they really are people who think of themselves as good, right. who are genuinely racist. And it's, it's one of those things that's sort of mind, you know, whatever. It's like, how could they be a good racist? Uh, and, 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 but anyway, so I think one of the reasons people reject embracing the idea that racism or Nazism or is that they think it means there's nothing redeeming in their being. So if you're saying you're totally a bad, evil person through and through, I can't accept that, right? It's like I can't accept that of myself. Uh, but if you say, you know, you, you did some terrible things uh, and let's look at those, but you also, your dad is saying, what about the good things that you know, Stonewall Jackson's lieutenant did. Right. And I have no doubt he did do some good yeah, things. Yeah, right. Uh, so anyway. That's right. Thank you. Hi, my name's Lois Karn. I live in Piedmont. We have a film series. It's free. You have it in Piedmont and in Oakland. So I want to talk to you about that at some point, like right after this. You, sir, I'm so sorry about your dad. I've fucking known from seeing all the films. And you and Dr. Hurd, UC Berkeley's a fine public institution it is, is making this be a never forget arrangement. I'm so pleased with all the programs. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I think you and then you. When you touched about the sound uh, with the PBS stations, did they, were they just saying, uh, did, they weren't receiving your idea because they were just, we can't play this? Or are you on your mind? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, the one was from I. I so I, my folks live in Jackson, Tennessee, um, and so I, I, our station wrangler. I said, you know, please reach out to to Jackson, uh, Memf the Memphis market. I think it's W B N O or K N O, something like that. And um, uh, and and maybe Jed can tell me because I think he got the email too. It was like, oh, it's so basically what the station wrangler does is they send out the first five minutes and and they watch and it was like, 
Well, it's, it's all about, I think her comments were something to the effect of, it's all about her, um, you know, I didn't see her, her reference her family. I mean, she clearly had only watched the first five minutes, you know, just the five minutes that she sent and just kind of discounted it, um, you know, just kind of lock, stock and barrel discounted it. Um, but then another one said, well, you know, in Mississippi said, um, well, um, my viewers, um, uh, what, what did he say? He said, this was a theater owner, actually. He said, um, my audience have moved on from that. My white audience have moved, has moved on from that. And the black people in, in, don't care anymore. So, I mean, you get, you get and, and I'm sure there'll be, there'll be more forthcoming, but it's just, you know, they're, they're, we also were told by the station wrangler that, you know, all this PBS programming is very closely monitored for, um, you know, being too far left. Um, and so our wrangler said that, she said, you know, honestly, quite, it'll probably do very well on the coasts, but the middle of the country in the south, you know, you'll have a hard time. But, but we have had, we had, we've had a station in Mississippi pick it up, and we're just getting going. So it's, it's very limited, but it wasn't surprising kind of what we heard back. But, but there, are, there are some people out there that have the courage, um, who will have the courage, I think, to show the film. So. Hi, uh, I'm an early supporter of the film. I loved it again, watching it again. Thank you. Um, I was struck by the film saying that in the 1970s and 80s, overt public racism had to go underground a little bit. And of course now we see that it's not coming, it's coming back up from being underground, right. which is very unfortunate. Um, you talked about repairing. Repairing needs resources. The greatest amount of resources that was expropriated in the history of the United States was in 1865 when all these four million pieces of property became people and were removed. We need that kind of expropriation again in order to have the resources to repair so I think we need to expropriate tons of resources from the capitalists and the wealthy people who have it in order to have that kind of repair. In order to do that, we need to reach a whole lot of white people who still vote, who still are engaged. And so I urge everybody to reach out to your friends and neighbors all around the country, tell them about the TED Talk, Tell them that it's going to be on PBS in February. Uh, reach out to PBS stations all around the country. And to politicians that you know, white politicians that you know or have some contact with, to tell them about the film. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. Nice to see you again. Who else? You and then you. Yeah, I believe, I believe oh. Um, oh. Southern slave owners were compensated for their loss. Yeah. I believe, weren't they? Am I correct there? Yeah. I, when, when the, yeah, for the loss of their slaves. That's really deep. I just have to say that. <laughs> it's like, I'm it's, sorry. Yeah. 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 Yep. They, yep. They, 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 they actually had to use the entire fortune of the English government, the Great Britain, to reap for two years. They had to split and pay half of it to the slave owners and the other half they used to operate. Right. Yeah. So it took that much. Okay, so I have a couple of points I'd like to make. Thank you for your film. And um, I'm a retired journalist of 23 okay. years. So I understand the tension of wanting the story and then having, you know, you're not supposed to be the story. Is right, and thank you. And, and that's, right, you know, yeah, anytime you're the story, there is no story, you right? Know, you're never supposed to be the story. Right. This is a new time. Um, so I appreciate you putting enough of yourself in there, but um, I just want to say that. One thing that's creeping into the lexicon right now that people should absolutely be aware of is um, because the language is so important is um, the term forced busing. I was a reporter in Wilmington, Delaware in the, in the early 1970s. It was my first newspaper reporting job. Um, I actually worked at the New York Times for one year as a clerical person and wrote 
the first paper then, but um, busing in Delaware was a huge issue. Delaware, most people don't know, during slavery times was half slave and half free, half slave or half free. There's three counties. The Mason-Dixon line cuts through the middle of the state, more or less. So above the Mason-Dixon line, free. Below the Mason-Dixon line, slave. slave. Which makes for a schizophrenic state when it comes to slavery. So I became aware as a young reporter that the terminology of my stories was getting really looked at super hard, and I didn't quite understand why, because I'm a New Yorker, that's not where I'm from. So my problem was that they had, they tended to use forced busing. And my brain said, it was legislated, so anything that's legislated by law, why would you substitute the word forced? forced right. But that's when I started seeing that term, forced busing. Why am I talking about this now? Because there's been a lot of discussion about Joe Biden uh, running for president, who is from Delaware. And it's been revealed that during, um, you know, he played ball with white segregationists, big time. And as a young reporter in Delaware, I covered an event where I saw him talk one way to an all black audience in a black housing project in Wilmington. And earlier that day, it was at night, Earlier that day, talked very differently um, on a racial issue, black and white, and uh, came and reported on it. Okay, so forced blessing. This is stuff, this was a mainstream newspaper article I just read this week. Because they're getting into it now. They're gonna get deeper into Biden. I don't hate Biden. But as a young reporter, I was, I, I, that was the first example of huge hypocrisy that I'd ever seen. And, um, and I never forgot that, I never forgot that. Because when people switch, code switch, mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting. Say one thing to black folks, another thing for the mm -hmm. So I wanted people to be on the lookout for the terminology that's in the paper. And there was one other thing. Why do we think all the racism that this country was built on disappeared like that? Mm. If you know history, when Nat King Cole had a nationally shown TV show, it was not shown in the Deep South. Why? Because TV sponsors wouldn't support it, right. no ads. But also, white husbands said, I don't want that nigga singing love songs to my wife in my living room. This is on record, you can find this. The other thing is movies, general movies of the time, back in the day, had scenes that could be cut when they were shown in the South. So that Lena Horne wouldn't be shown beautiful as she was singing. Because white Southerners didn't want to see that. So let's fast forward to the Wranglers at PBS. What's the connection? So I just wonder why do we, you know, why do we think all that stuff just went away? It just didn't. It just went underground. And Donald Trump pulled the lid, it's like pulling the scalp off your head and exposing all those nerves and veins and blood. Thank you so much for your, yeah, for your comments. Um, very well taken. Yeah. Uh, others, I saw there were others. I just wanted to give a chance to others in the audience. Professor Powell, I deeply admire you and who you are. And I'm really curious, and I'm gonna ask you a personal question. If you don't want to answer it, I, I fully accept that. But how have you become the beautiful person you are within our system, our horrible system of institutionalized racism? Well, thank you for the question and, and, and the comment. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, sometimes, you know, I have one of these unusual educational journey. So I went to all these August schools like Stanford and Yale and Berkeley and, and um, my family were from the South. Uh, my parents were sharecroppers. And like I said, I'm six of nine. So more than once a reporter would come to me and it's like, explain yourself. You know, like the rest of your family sort of looks like deadbeats or at least, you know, they didn't go to 
on the college and look at you. You know, you've done all these incredible things. Uh, so you're exceptional. And my response has always been, or some version of this, do you know about sea turtles? I said, no, I don't know about sea turtles. They, tens of thousands of sea turtles are laid on the beach. And when they hatch, the seagulls are there and waiting. Thousands of sea seagulls waiting for the sea turtles to hatch. When the sea turtles hatch, they start running to the ocean. And about 99 out of 100 don't make it. The seagulls get, and that one makes it. Uh, and to some extent, I'm that one. And I'd be a fool to think the reason I got to the ocean was because of something about me. You know, that I had a special move, that seagulls coming in, it's like, <laughs> no you don't. <laughs> All the 99 that died contributed to my getting to the ocean. Uh, so when I look at my family and the people around me, it's like, if I am anything special, it's because they gave me something special. Um, and uh, some of you know I talk often about my family and most recently about my dad. And I said to Marianne recently that he just died about a week or so ago. He had hit his head and died. Uh, it was hard, but it's still hard. I'm processing it. But I feel like I take on part of his life to live, to continue to live, to continue the legacy. So I think that's true for all of us, that if we have anything really good and really beautiful, it's because we have a circle of people around us uh, that's caring and loving. So thank you for your question. Yes, yes. Thanks for your excellent presentation. I, uh, I've been a long time activist, and most of my friends are very radical or ultra left. Um, and I, but I have this one person I know that I didn't really know politics and his, his opinions for a while. And he's extremely intelligent. He's uh, very, very helpful, supportive. I was sick for a while, and he was very helpful. But then I found out that he was a Trump supporter. <laughs> and then I found out he's very, very racist. He, uh, <clears throat> he blames all the problems of society and, and, uh, and the minorities. Uh, so I say to myself, why am I continue to be friends with this person if my friend knew his, if my friends knew his politics they would think I was crazy. However, like I say, he's been very helpful and that's a good thing. So I, I invited him to I've invited him to gatherings with my friends. And I told him, remember, they're, they're very anti Trump. <laughs> and to be careful. And uh, so uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a big party, and he came, and he and his girlfriend sat through it. And I saw them listening to other people, conversations, there were about 40 people. And uh, um, they left after about two-thirds of the party, but I, I can see little cracks, you know, little openings when I deal with him. Uh, we play tennis together. Uh, we do other things. Uh, I'm not, he's not one of my best friends, but he's a friend. And I, I see that he's opening up a little bit. He said a few negative things about Trump. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm feeling so optimistic. I'm questioning whether my, I'm, I guess I'm feeling guilty about being his friend. But then again, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking maybe uh, he can do some good. Do you have a question for, yeah. uh, for the panel? Yeah, no. I well, so, I think, yeah, go ahead, John. I'm just going to have to leave. I, my, my alarm went off in my car. I think it's supposed to be here to. Uh, I see more artists who shaking their head that yeah. it's time to go. But I just want to say we have a whole thing of the instrument othering and belonging on bridging. Yes. How do you connect with people who are different than you? Uh, the process of engaging in compassionate and empathetic listening, both at an individual and a structural level. Um, one, I, I met with a guy who's had a StoryCorps, Dave Itzy, you may know his work. StoryCorps is a beautiful platform. Uh, he said he was talking to one of the national leaders of the Ku Klux Klan, who's since converted. And he said to him, you know thousands of racists. Uh, are any of them beyond the pale? And he said, no. I don't know if I'm convinced. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we don't know how far we can go. Um, so people are complicated. 
um, and, and we love, I mean, even our own families. Most of us, if we talk about our own families, there's someone in the family, you know, um, they give you the shirt off their back, uh, and yet you don't necessarily want them over at Thanksgiving. So <laughs> it's complicated. But if yeah. you go to our website and look at stuff around bridging and breaking, there'll be some tools in there that it will be, we think will be helpful. And again, thank, thank you, you very much, John. Myself. Thank you. Thank you.